to see it. So with that, I want to get us started with this evening with our good panel of speakers here. Uh, we have Allison Gill. She is the American Atheist Vice President for Legal and Policy, managing the organization's federal and state advocacy for religious equality and litigation activities to protect the separation of religion and government. Allison is a nationally recognized expert on civil rights law and state advocacy. We also have Sam Faruqi, Secretary of Secular Women, immigrated from Florida to Pakistan to Florida from Pakistan when they were seven years old and found themselves to be an atheist by 14. They went on to have a BS in psychology from Florida State University where they organized the first ever Southeast Secular Student Regional Conference as one of the founding officers of the Student Secular Alliance at FSU. Focusing on grassroots community organizing, not only along lines of belief and faith or lack thereof, but also race, gender, gender identity, sexuality, and other socio-political identities and intersections. They are greatly interested in social institutions and systems and how they arise and how they affect people's lives. And last but certainly not least, we have Stephanie Zvan, who is the president of Minnesota Atheists and on the board of Secular Women. She's one of the co-founders of Secular Women Work Conferences, and teaches geeks about science and critical thinking at science fiction and fantasy conventions and atheists about community and national and regional conferences. Her writing on the intersection of science and politics has appeared in the Scientific American guest blog. Her work on codes of conduct is shared as a resource at the Geek Feminism Wiki and other venues. She hosts and interviews for Atheist Talk Radio and you can find her writing at Almost Diamonds on the Orbit. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Allison to get us started with the presentation tonight. Thank you so much, Sam, and thank you everyone for joining tonight. We're really excited to be talking about the Non-Religious Women in America report. Let me go ahead and share it, the slides. Okay. How's that looking? Good? All right, perfect. So um, this is a, a new brand new report we released last week in partnership with American Atheists and Secular, Secular Women, Women. So we're pretty excited about it. Uh, this is our third of three um, you know, subpopulation briefs we're doing based on the data from the U.S. Secular Survey that was conducted in 2019. The first two subpopulation briefs, one was on uh, Black non-religious people and one was on um, non-religious young people. So this is the third. We're going to do two more, but they're going to have to be a surprise. So you'll hear about them later this year. But let's talk about non-religious women. And we'll start with the agenda. So first I'll talk about why we do this and why data is important in the first place. Uh, then we'll, I'll provide some data about non-religious women from this, the report. And then uh, Sam will be talking about women in secular communities. And then Sam and Stephanie will talk about recommendations, both from the report and, and building upon that for, for further conversation on recommendations to, for groups. So with that, let's get started about why data matters. So, there is just a real lack of data about non-religious people in this country. And it's not just non-religious people, it's data about religion at all um, that's collected on federal surveys. The vast majority of federal surveys don't collect any sort of data to di differentiate among different religious groups. And because of that, the differences between groups and the disparities that they face is largely invisible. There is, um, you know, that's one of the major ways we understand and get data about the U.S. population is through a whole host of federal data surveys, such as the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which looks at young people in schools and looks at their health and, and risks that they encounter on things like smoking, things like bullying, that sort of thing. And there's, um, there's many others, like the, uh, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, for example, or MISDA. And I could go on and on with weird acronyms you've never heard of, but still, there's a lot of surveys and almost none of them ask about religion, which is the problem, because that means we don't really know a lot about our, our population or other uh, religious minority populations. So we know, what we do know usually co has come from surveys conducted by organizations such as the Pew Research Center and PRRI, which do really great research on demographics, primarily of different religious groups. They do some, you know, uh, thoughts about like beliefs and priorities of those groups. Um, however, they don't really dig in very in depth to any of these groups because they just don't have the sample size because it's a population survey. So it's a large number of people and only some of them are non-religious or Catholic or Jewish or what have you. 
So this survey that we're going to be talking about today is really focused on non-religious people. And I want to clarify something. When we're talking about the Pew and PR, PRRI briefs, they, they often talk about religiously unaffiliated people or so-called nuns, uh, not N-U-N-S, but nuns, as in none of the above. And so that is a really rapidly growing subset of uh, the population in the US that does not religiously um, identify with any particular belief system. There is some sort of conflation with of those people with non-religious people, but it's not actually the case. Only a subset of the nuns are non-religious. And let me give you an example. Of the nuns, about 34% say that religion is somewhat or very important in their life. And about 61% believe in some sort of God or universal spirit. So that's of the nuns category. So it goes to show we're not talking necessarily about non-religious people. We're talking about a broad swath of people. Some are non-religious and some are not. Uh, the closer numbers, it's probably closer to about 9% of the population, which is, you know, I would say actively non-religious. And the way that we looked at it in the data we collected are people that identify with one or more non-religious labels, such as atheist, agnostic, humanist, skeptic, freethinker, et cetera. So I wanna make that differentiation because I think it's really important when we hear about you know, the nuns being one of the largest groups now in our society, we're not really talking about one group, we're talking about a whole bunch of different groups pushed together and only some of them are actually our community. Um, okay. So the lack of data is even more significant for non-religious women who are un underrepresented in secular communities. Why is data important? Well, I mentioned a second ago, without data, non-religious people and the issues that they face are invisible. If we, don't know, if we don't have this data that shows that where there are disparities in education, in health, um, in the workplace, then we can't point to them and all we have is anecdotes. And anecdotes differ in different areas. They don't, they don't, you know, they're useful sometimes as stories, but they don't prove things in the same sort of way that we need to if we're going to sort of vigorously engage in public policy debates and sort of make our the issues our community is facing well known. And so that's why we need, you know, real hard data and not just anecdotes. And they differ so much. I mean, someone growing up in New Jersey, for example, might have a very, very different experience being non-religious than someone growing up in Mississippi. Right, so their anecdotes are going to be completely different, and neither of them will talk about the whole experience of being non-religious in America, which is why we need data. Um, data is incredibly important for both understanding the community needs and for advocating for them. You know, when I walk into a lawmaker's office and talk about a bill and how it would affect non-religious people, the first thing they're going to ask is, how many people does this affect? How many, you know, who is, who are we talking about? How are they, how are they impacted? And with stats, we are actually able to answer those questions and talk about who's actually being affected by policy changes. So for advocacy, it can be really important. And the data we've gotten from these, this research, we've used on a multitude of Supreme Court briefs, on testimonies in, I don't know, many, most every state, all over the place. So this has been incredibly useful in many ways. Um, also, these data is useful for improving services. Like, for example, we know that um, bullying against non-religious people happens in schools. Well, you know, maybe bullying programs should bring, bring that into account. They should talk about, you know, non-bullying against non-religious people, as well as the other categories that, um, you know, that they talk about people being bullied for in schools. So that's an example of improving existing programs by looking at that and seeing where the need is. And lastly, there's, uh, you really need that in order to seek funding, either from uh, grant agencies like at the federal level or in the state level or um, foundations and because it, you have to actually show there's a problem in order to get funding to sort of address those problems and get programming funding. So this is just some of the reasons why data is really important and why we felt it was really incredibly important for us to do this this work. So another question why are non-religious women less visible? Like why is there sort of this idea in many places or this stereotype that, you know, atheist communities are, are only men or atheists are only men or, you know, there's all sorts of sort of attitudes and stereotypes about atheists and their lack of, of women, which are, of course, ridiculous. It's in part owing to a lack of available data, which I've been talking about. But there are stereotypes with atheism being associated with being emotionless 
overly scientific, rationalistic, masculine. So there are some stereotypes out there about that. And that has a greater impact on women who, because it more clashes with how society expects women to act. So it has a greater stigmatizing effect on women, which makes, it, it creates what's called greater social risk, which makes women less likely, somewhat less likely to identify with those labels. And in fact, that's what we see um, in our, in our there's, there's research actually showing that um, 60% of men who say that there is no God use the term atheist, while only 50% of women who say there is no God use the term atheist. So that's a, that's a good example. In our research, we found that non-religious women were much more likely to, to primarily identify as a humanist. Now, the majority of the non-religious women respondents were did primarily identify as atheists, but the number of humanists was primarily a humanist was much higher than for the other populations. Um, and part of it is because of the increased risk for community stigma for non-religious women. And significant part is how atheist communities are perceived um, as being primarily male dominated and unwelcoming. So there's a perception of that as well. And that can also be why we don't see as many uh, sort of a higher number of atheist women or uh, there's still these stereotypes about atheist communities. Um, I think I'll leave it there. I know we're going to talk more about this in the latter sections. So let's get on to the data. Okay. So about the sample first, the US Secular Survey was conducted in 2019. It was a survey of uh, nearly 34,000 non-religious people all across the country. So it was really a massive survey. And about 40% or more than 13,500 were non-religious women. And so that, that is what this report is about, that segment of the, of the data. And this, the survey was done online through convenience sampling. Outreach was through partnerships with a whole host of different organizations, including Secular Women, for example, and many others, um, and, as well as local meetup groups. And you know, through every avenue we could get out to people, we tried to do so. But that does mean this is a what's called a convenience sample or a snowball sample. It's not representative of all non-religious people in this country. It is representative of itself. So it's it's a sample itself that we're looking at. It doesn't mean that just because we had 40% uh, women here in this sample that 40% of, of non-religious people are women. That's not how it works. Coincidentally, however, I did look this up and the surveys produced by Pew showed that 32% of atheists and 38% of agnostics uh, in their research identified, you know, were, were women. So that's, uh, it's not, not perfectly aligned, but there is some similarities there. But regardless, this is not uh, representative, and I want to make that clear up front. So here is the report cover. Uh, beautiful. <laughs> you can find it at secularsurvey.org. That's secularsurvey.org, along with all the other reports, the reality check report, which looks at the full set of the data, as well as the other subpopulation briefs I was talking about earlier. Okay, so compared to the rest of the sample, non-religious women tended to be, uh, they were more likely to be LGBTQ, and they were twice as likely to be bisexual. They were more likely to live in very religious areas, which is interesting. I may have something to do, we're gonna talk later about engagement with community groups. And they were more likely to primarily identify as humanist. So uh, I talked about that a minute ago. So there's a lot more information about this sample and their aspects, um, the breakdown, racial breakdown, the, um, um, you know, where they live geographically around the country, all that information is in the report. So I urge you to check it out. One of the most important things we looked at is community religiosity. So it was really striking from the data, the differences between how non-religious people are treated uh, and what they face in very religious communities versus other communities, like less religious communities. And here we see about one third of the um, non-religious women respondents lived in very religious communities. So they had higher levels of discrimination, family rejection, stigma, 
and worse psychological outcomes across the board, scoring higher on loneliness and likely depression. So it really is impactful and it is very different for um, people in, in very religious communities versus other areas. And I think that's really something to keep in mind when we're talking about this data. Um, I like to point out that I grew up in New Jersey and I live in DC. So I've never really lived in a very religious um, area like this, but it's, you know, for someone like me who's an atheist who lives in those areas, we're like, oh, it doesn't seem like that big a deal, but it, it really is uh, to a lot of people who face re very real discrimination and oppression as our stats will show you in a few minutes. And I think it's really uh, critical to understand uh, that that is the case across the country, that not everywhere is like New Jersey and DC. <laughs> Um, that's one of the reasons I, I really appreciate this data to help uh, remind us that, you know, this is this is what we're fighting for to make sure people can be express their non religious religious beliefs, non religious beliefs everywhere, and they can be who they are, regardless of where they live. So let's talk about family experiences first. We found that among non religious women 25 years or older more than two fifths or 43% reported that their parents or guardians were not aware of the religious beliefs before age 25, either because they did not have non-religious beliefs before age 25 or they were concealing them basically. Um, and so of those parents who were aware about one in five had very unsupportive parents. So we call that family rejection when parents act very unsupportive of, of one's beliefs and, and identity. Um, and it has had very significant psychological effects. Women with very unsupportive parents were about 80% more likely to scream positive for depression than those with very religious parents, and they had about 17% higher loneliness. So it's pretty significant differences. We also saw that nearly three-fifths reported negative experiences due to their beliefs with their families. Um, and they, those people who had negative experiences with their families because of their non-religious beliefs were about, also about 80% more likely to experience um, depression. So this is significantly higher for people living in very religious communities where nearly two thirds had negative experiences with their families and also among um, black non-religious women who also were two thirds had negative experiences with their families. So we're seeing some elevated rates for different groups, depending on where they live and different zone populations. Also, we wanted to note that about two fifths of women said that they had somewhat or very strict religious expectations growing up. And those who grew up with these very strict religious expectations, uh, they were about 11.8, about 12% more lonely than those without such expectations. So it had an impact on them you know, afterwards, after growing up. We saw, you know, it's uh, had a significant impact over time as well. So that's what the chart on the right shows, the degree to which uh, women had, participants had different levels of uh, expectations on them regarding religion. We also asked about negative incidents that people had because of their non-religious beliefs in different areas of their lives when sometimes sometimes this is representative of discrimination so negative incidents in things like employment or education we usually frame it in that way so here we have the chart that shows incidents people have had incidents in the last three years uh, for women participants compared to everybody else and we can see across the board women reported more discrimination in nearly every area of their lives and when it came, comes to healthcare, we saw a significant, significantly higher proportion of women um, having negative incidents in reproductive care, mental health, and other health care. We also saw higher rates in education, employment, adoption, foster care, um, military. And those who experienced higher discrimination also had very, also, those who experienced discrimination also had heightened rates of likely depression. This was really not uniform though, these high rates of discrimination. We saw that they are, depend on the, the different area. Like for example, we saw higher discrimination uh, in education in the South and lower discrimination for reproductive care in the Northeast. And most markedly, we saw that the difference is based on community religiosity. So here's a chart that shows the breakdown of different areas by community religiosity. So you can see, you know, for the people living in very religious areas, 
it's just uh, really significantly higher across the board in different in different areas. Um, for education, it was about 2.5 times uh, more likely to experience discrimination than those women living in less religious areas. And for all these other categories, education, I'm sorry, employment, private businesses, reproductive care, it was about twice as, as likely to have discrimination uh, in very religious areas. So it's really significant, those findings. We also looked at stigma, uh, stigmatization of non-religious beliefs and non-religious people in different ways. So the way we looked at this is by uh, asking people whether they faced or they encountered various microaggressions, which are um, that non-religious people often face that sort of identify them as outsiders or others or not being accepted or part of society. So things that are stigmatizing. And we created a scale to look at, um, you know, whether these, uh, how often these uh, what's called microaggressions are being encountered, and so that we can compare these across different categories and aspects. So when it says the mean there, that mean is uh, the average for all these categories for non-religious women was 2.28 on a scale of one to five, from never encountering these to almost always encountering these. Um, these stigmatizing experiences. And so we found overall that stigma was about 10% higher for non-religious women compared to other participants. And it was also 10% higher for women living in the South compared to other non-religious women. And for those living in very religious communities, it was about a little bit over 40% higher. So that was a very significant change. People living in very religious, communi very religious communities faced much higher stigma for being non-religious, which is probably not surprising, but it is noteworthy that we can actually, you know, show that uh, and, and show that it is that is that is actually happening and show that the um, the, the issues people are facing. Non-religious women with children also experienced about 12.8% higher stigma than those non-religious women without children. So we also there was also something worth noting. Um, and those who experienced more stigma also had were more lonely. Um, so that did have a psychological impact on people as well. One of the ways that people try to avoid discrimination and stigma is by concealing their non-religious beliefs. And so we asked the participants in various areas of their lives, did they conceal their non-religious beliefs from others, including at school, among strangers, among your family, uh, people at work, et cetera. And so that's what this chart shows is we ask people how often they conceal their non-religious beliefs from never to always. Um, and so women participants concealed their beliefs at only very, very slightly more altogether than other, other participants, but they were more likely to conceal their beliefs um, from specific, in specific areas of their lives, for example, from their extended family and from their uh, friends and acquaintances. So those, there were some differences there, but oh, that was the, the major difference. So overall, it looks a lot like other participants in, in terms of concealment. We did see, however, that about one, there was one quarter more concealment in very religious communities compared to not at all religious ones. So uh, where there is, again, very religious communities, there is much higher concealment in addition to having much higher stigma and discrimination. So why is this important? Well, significant research has shows that the concealment can lead to people feeling a lack of authenticity, to having difficulty establishing close ties with others, to experiencing more social isolation and having lower feelings of belonging and psychological well-being. So it has an impact on people when they have to conceal, conceal important parts of themselves. Um, it can make it more difficult for them to connect with others and have a psychological impact as well. So not only can stigma have psychological impact, but concealing because of concerns about stigma or discrimination can also have a, a pretty negative impact on people. So we've talked about psychological impact of various experiences, but I wanna talk about uh, one really important protective factor and that's engagement with secular communities. So even with all the barriers we've been discussing, non-religious um, women participants were more likely than, than more likely to be members of local secular organizations than other participants. It's about 25% of our 
non-religious women participants and about 20% of, of others. So it was, you know, pretty substantially higher. Um, and women with children were even more likely to be members of those of local groups than those without children. So that's sort of counterintuitive, but it shows that there's a real desire to connect with local groups among non-religious women. Um, local, the level of local group membership varied quite a lot by region and by community religiosity. And that's what those charts show here. We can see uh, in very in, you know, by different areas, uh, levels of religiosity, women were more engaged in other participants in communities, um, local, local organizations, and also by census region, they were more engaged as well, especially in the South and in very religious communities. Um, in very religious communities, women were more than 1.5 times as likely to be members of local organizations than other, than other participants. Um, we also see that women with, who are members of, of national or local secular organizations were nearly a third less likely to be at risk for depression than women who were not members. So as I was saying, it has a really important protective factor to have that community. Um, and our data sort of backs that, that up. And I know we're going to talk more about that when it comes to recommendations, but I want to flag that as, as really critical. We also asked um, participants, not only were they engaged with local secular organizations, but what sorts of activities did they do with them or were they interested in doing with them? And overall, women were slightly more likely to be interested in social and volunteer activities. It was very, very minor. But when we, uh, we saw more notable changes, when we looked at the differences with women with children, so first of all, women with children, sorry, women were more likely, more than 1.5 times as likely to take advantage of activities for people with children than other participants. So let me repeat that. Women were more than 1.5 times as likely to take advantage of, of opportunities for people with children than other, other, other participants. So that was a really important way to engage non-religious, local groups could engage non-religious women. However, women with children were less likely to take advantage of other activities with secular groups, despite their comparatively greater interest, which is what the chart on the right shows, right? And despite the fact that they were more likely to be members of local groups and other organizations. So there's a greater interest and a higher level of, of membership, but there's less engagement. And that's what the, uh, the chart on the left shows with different types of activities by women with children. So again, it shows that there is and clearly an unmet need here. And it's a barrier to engagement with local secular groups. Um, that's someone that can be addressed. And I'm sure we're gonna address that more when it comes to recommendations. But I just wanna set that up because it the data is pretty, pretty neat here, right? It shows that there is a desire and that when these programs are offered, women are more likely to engage, but that if they are not offered, it's harder to engage. I can't be more clear than that. So I wanna talk about one last thing here. And that's policy priorities. So we asked uh, participants to name their top, to list their top three uh, policy priorities from a list um, that they think that non uh, secular organizations should be prioritizing or working on uh, that are basically secular issues that, that groups like American Atheists, Secular Women, um, Freedom from Religion Foundation, AHA, others should be focused on. Um, and the top three, I think, results for everybody were maintaining secular public schools, access to abortion and contraception, and opposing religious exemptions that allow for discrimination. Those were the top three for, for all participants. However, if we break it out by women, women participants versus other participants, we see uh, some pretty stark differences, um, especially number two there, access to abortion and contraception. So, for non-religious women, that almost tied as their top one with maintaining secular public schools. It was about 48, 48% about for each of those. And you can see the difference for other participants, it fell all the way down to 31%. So um, it's really significant. If, if not for non-religious women being in the poll, it would have not been among the top three. Right? So that's a, a pretty significant difference there. Um, but there's other differences as well. Um, you can see more like, for example, protecting uh, public funding of religious, preventing public funding of religious schools seem to be uh, not quite as important or not as much of a priority, opposing religious displays on public property. So uh, this is just to give you an idea. Remember, people could only pick three. 
So there were some hard choices made here, I think. But regardless, it's an interesting thing to see how people prioritize these different issues as secular issues. And with that, I will stop talking and pass it over to Sam. Hey, um, can we go to the next slide, please? <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Sam. Uh, to give you a little bit more background uh, to add on to what uh, other Sam mentioned earlier. Um, so I was not born in the United States. Uh, I was born in Pakistan, which is a Muslim majority country. Um, and then I moved to the United States when I was about seven um, to South Florida, which is a very pluralistic area where religious uh, oppression is not really as big of a deal um, in Wilton Manors in South Florida is one of like two cities where the entire uh, city uh, government is queer people. <laughs> um, so you know, in South Florida, there was definitely uh, a good amount of uh, release in terms of religious pressure. Um, you know, the first atheists that I ever met were the first like five atheists that I ever became aware of were, you know, people of color. Um, so it's, you know, a little bit atypical with regard to uh, demographics when compared to the rest of the country. Um, but then when I uh, went to college, I went to college at, to, uh, at FSU, which is in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, we have a little joke that uh, pretty much everyone in Florida uh, <laughs> is aware of, uh, which is the South really starts the further in the North you get in Florida. Um, and so Tallahassee is, you know, big plantations still exist there. Uh, the university itself was founded with the proceeds from slave owner. Um, so you know, it was a very different environment all of a sudden, and that is the context in which, um, you know, a lot of people from South Florida found themselves. So uh, on campus, it was frequently kind of a clash of different uh, values, demographics. There would be, um, you know, preachers on campus all the time, um, half, like half the tables, uh, for student organizations would be, you know, various religious student groups. Um, and, you know, there were, by, by the time that I got there, there was one student group that was, um, you know, it was called Freethinkers at FSU. Uh, it was for secular people, but they were so uh, small and they didn't really advertise themselves much. They just got together once a week and talked about how much religion sucks. And it was, the vast majority of it was male, the vast majority of it's white. Um, I think there was one <laughs> person of color there and he was a guy. Um, so we kind of uh, relaunched everything. Um, I you know, became one of the founding officers of the Florida the uh, Secular Student Alliance at Florida State University, along with a few other people. Um, and there are a lot of things that need to be restructured, but I'll get to those. Um, the context that we uh, organized in, um, and that later I uh, organized with other people in, uh, was initially you know, local student organizing, uh, a lot of young adults from all over Florida and the South. Um, and then I also progressed into a local community organizing with the Center for Inquiry Tallahassee um, from 2015 to 17. Uh, Florida has a good number of secular groups. Um, there's one in Tampa, there are some in South Florida, there, North Florida has some, uh, Central Florida has them. And I, it's largely because there are so many retirees and near retirees in Florida uh, who are nearing the end of their lives and grappling with the tough questions. Um, and from there, I moved on to regional student organizing with the Secular Student Alliance uh, in Columbus, Ohio, taking care of high schools and colleges across 25 states and Puerto Rico. Um, you know, this exposed me to a lot of different contexts, uh, different student groups and uh, different um, affiliates uh, were grappling with different things. Um, 
but this is a picture from the Sec Southeast Secular Student Regional Conference, um, the first of its kind in the Southeast of the United States. Um, this is from back when I was uh, a student organizer. Um, I think at that point we'd managed to become one of the most diverse uh, student groups affiliated with the SSA, both in terms of gender and uh, racial and religious background. Um, and you know there are quite a few steps that we had to take to get there, um, but we will get to that as well. Um, awesome. Uh, so some of the observations uh, that you know, I perceived across all these different contexts, uh, particularly with regard to uh, women and people of other genders. Uh, the first thing was tokenization and shielding, um, particularly as intersecting with race and former religious community. A lot of the time uh, when women and people of other genders existed in these groups, they would be largely, you know, set to the margins of the group. Um, they had to put in more effort to be seen as, you know, whole and valid members, uh, you know, contributors to the community. Um, and at the same time, whenever there were, you know, objections from outside the community where, you know, someone would talk about how atheists are, you know, morally bad or whatever, they would bring out the women to be their tokens and like shield them from these accusations. Um, this is, you know, a really interesting dynamic um, because, uh, you know, on one hand, atheist women are seen as inherently less moral um, by virtue of being atheists, especially if they're vocal about it, especially if they're actively trying to be in community with other atheists. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, it's, when you have like when when you want to you know try to appropriate the moral value that is uh projected onto women and the things that they're involved in um you know atheist groups are very happy to do that um <laughs> um and this also goes for you know race and former religious community um essentially within the group they would be marginalized but uh their actual involvement, despite being prevented from being as involved as they really wanted to be, uh, would be used as a counter argument uh, and a cover for uh, you know, the white heterosexual cis atheist men to continue doing whatever they were doing, which was usually just you know a circle jerk about how bad religion is. Um, <laughs> um, another uh, observation: unequal distribution of routine labor. This is something that's present across the board wherever women exist, basically, um, where you know the big uh, fancy events are headed up by uh, like the public pers uh, the public officers are generally the men, uh, the people who are approached by, oh, you did such a great thing, uh, how did you do it? By audience members, it's it's men, but meanwhile, the people who are actually running the show in the background are all women. Um, you know, this unequal distribution of routine labor and how the routine labor that women perform in these communities to actually build up these communities is invisibilized. Um, and so, uh, you know, because of this, uh, anytime uh, there are issues that are very uh, relevant to the lives of women um, and people of other genders, they're seen as a special interest because, and this goes into the next point as well, because women as a whole in these communities are seen as support rather than, you know, full members of the group in their own right. Um, and, you know, I know here it says partners of male leaders, um, but really this is male members in general. Uh, frequently what happens is that, you know, people, couples will show up to groups um, and they're both atheists, mean, but the, uh, you know, the, woman in this relationship is seen as like someone who's just tagging along um, or, and you know, the, the role of a leader is like artificially ascribed to the man of that relationship by virtue of the fact uh, that he, he's not a single man. Um, so the dynamic in general um, in these communities really contributes, oh, let me get to the last point actually also. Um, 
There's also very little accommodation for familial responsibilities. Um, so, for, you know, as we all know, uh, women are generally uh, relegated to childcare duties, domestic duties in general, um, and you know they're on the hook for them. So, you know, anytime you're scheduling an event um, and it's like right after school when kids need to be picked up or um, you know, dinner needs to be made or you know, whatnot. Uh, these are not considerations that are uh, taken into account when uh, these events are being uh, developed and organized. Um, Childcare is usually not present. No one even asks these women. It's entirely, you know, no one comes up to them and is like, oh, do you need someone to take care of your kids? Or do you, how do you think uh, we can attract, you know, women who have children? Uh, this is actually in stark uh, difference when, you know, when you look at how religious communities work. People, you know, try to chip in where they can. They're very service oriented. Um, the, you know, the entire concept of child rearing is not seen as, you know, an individualized, individualistic thing. Um, it's seen as something that, you know, the whole community is involved in because, you know, in religious communities, we're, you know, you want kids to be there. You want to steep them in these values. There's a reason why all of these like friction points um, have to do with children uh, and giving birth to them and educating them and raising them. Um, and I think, you know, when we, in all these groups, uh, you know, it'd be male leaders, uh, organizing events, um, organizing discussion topics, um, not really taking into account um, the fact that their variation of religious experience is not the only one. Um, and not, you know, understanding that you're building a community rather than simply debating whatever the issue du jour is. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, so some recommendations. Um, this is one of the social media uh, posts that are available for everyone to share if you would like to uh, after the webinar. Um, generally for community building and organizing, uh, you want to be responsive to the needs and interests of non-religious women. Um, as Allison mentioned, non-religious women are more likely to engage in social volunteer advocacy activities. People ha have no idea the degree to which women form the backbone of all of the work that is done in a community because it's so invisibilized. Um, you know, I've seen <laughs> various uh, you know groups where uh, you know a woman is unavailable for something, but and that just means the work doesn't get done. <laughs> um, but um, you know, that's not something that is really incorporated into our analysis of, or any post-mortem post of events when we have those as well. Um, at the same time, uh, <laughs> you know, there's this whole trend of intellectualism essentially uh, that runs through um, you know, secular, at least in the U.S., uh, secular communities, where uh, you know people don't get together in these secular communities just to enjoy each other's company, just to you know hang out with kids. It's specifically so that they can like find the true nature of whatever, <laughs> um, and it you know it makes it difficult, especially for people who have, especially for women who have kids, to you know sit through those things, um, and so they you know they are pushed to the sidelines all the time. Um, all right, we can continue on to the next slide. Um, so some practical steps that you can take. Uh, the first one would be, uh, you know, just maintaining a baseline communal awareness that the religion of men is not necessarily the same as the religion of women or other genders, uh, especially when we're talking about Christianity or other religions that maintain sometimes pretty rigid separation of spheres. Um, in terms of, you know, the, their practicing population. Um, something else to be aware of is that religious communities other than Christian sects 
allow for non-binary gender and expression, and that is going to be reflected in apostates. So if you are, you know, a group that is very cishet and white and male, um, you know, sometimes what will happen is that a trans person will come in and it, you know, while they're theoretically progressive, um, you know, it, it doesn't really bear out in how they <laughs> interact with the person um, and how they, you know, take the feedback any feedback that, that person gives. Um, another thing you can do is preemptively account for and address unequal distribution of routine labor and the invisibility of labor. So, for example, you know, if you know that there are there's you know a woman or uh, a non-binary person who is constantly doing. Uh, you know, a bunch of work, it's really up to you to not constantly take that as granted. Um, it's, you know, you, if someone is willing to put their time in like that, um, it really does, you know, they really should be being developed more instead of seen as like a grunt. Um, <laughs> uh, um, and, you know, it can be as simple as just being like, thank you. Et cetera, et cetera, for doing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so much of the time that doesn't even exist. Um, another thing you can do is, you know, deliberately take time to communally explore issues that are usually deemed special interests. So, you know, all of this time that we spend debating, uh, you know, whether uh, like the, the newest instance of hypocrisy from the Christian right or whatever, um, instead of, positioning, uh, you know, discussion topics uh, in that in that way, um, instead of framing them in that way, you can, you know, have a discussion specifically about, you know, test, like, just as an example, um, have people, have women come in who have had abortions and talk mm -hmm. about their testimonies and the experience that they had to, you know, go through. Um, a lot of men, and this is something that's like, everyone in reproductive justice uh, circles is like always seething about the fact that there are like never any men in there. Um, it's a lot of atheist women in there uh, who have decided to, you know, go where they're not actively repudiated so much of the time. Um, just an example. Um, we can continue on to the next slide. Um, practice, practical steps continued. <laughs> um, another thing, and this is a really big one, I thought about putting this in bold and then I guess I just didn't, uh, form coalitions with other quote unquote special interest groups in your area. Uh, reproductive justice spaces in particular are full of atheist women uh, at out who have decided to prioritize those that prioritize them. Um, I think the general feeling is that, okay, so it's not happening in secular spaces, so we need to be a bit more targeted. And, you know, the interesting thing is that, you know, the kind of violence that's projected onto these uh, reproductive, re reproductive justice spaces is specifically enabled by the fact that it's the vast majority of the people working in, the, in those spaces are women. Uh, like there's so many coalitions that can be formed with other groups in, in your area, even if they're not explicitly atheist, if you share the same interests. Um, but, you know, if your secular group is not uh, amenable to thinking of, uh, you know, reproductive justice as uh, a vested interest rather than like a special interest, uh, then, you know, you, you got some work to do. <laughs> uh, Another thing you can do is actively manage open discussions with a moderator. Um, men love talking over women slash others. Um, and a lot of the time, it's not even just that they do that. A lot of the time it's that women are afraid to speak up uh, because, you know, if it's like a free for all, you know, men are adept, adept at talking uh, down, like talking, over people, talking down at people, anything <laughs> regarding dominance uh, in the verbal sense uh, is very prominent in a lot of these spaces. And it's especially prominent when they feel like they have something righteous to say, um, which is a sense that also pervades uh, secular communities. Um, 
Another thing you can do is actively create plans to nurture and develop the leadership of women and non-men in your community, putting money behind it if need be. Um, these are, you know, women and non-men in general are frequently looked over for things like this. Uh, meanwhile, they are forming the backbone and doing all the groundwork of actually keeping everything running. Um, you know, one of the more fundamental rules of, you know, grassroots organizing electoral or issues, um, organizing in general, just organizing, you know, labor organizing, any kind of organizing you, you know, can think of. Uh, at this point, I think I've gotten into labor organizing, community organizing, issues organizing. Um, what else? There are a couple others. <laughs> but in all of those, one of the more fundamental precepts is that you take the people who are already doing the work instead of looking them over because you don't think they fit your profile of what a leader should be. Um, yeah, uh, I think more steps. I think slide. <laughs> okay, that's that's it for my part. <laughs> uh, so this is mine. You will discover that um, Sam and I echo each other quite a bit, unsurprising since we sit on the same board that actually deals with a lot of these issues. Um, so the next recommendation from the report for building community um, is disrupting sexism. It's important to remember that we, we're surrounded by sexism. We live in a sexist society, much like we live in a racist society, much like we live in a um, Christian nationalist society here in the US. Um, so it's going to be there, um, wishful thinking, thinking that atheists are great people, even when they are, those aren't just, that those won't cut it. You actually have to be prepared to deal with it. Um, there are a few things that you can do, um, proactively present, uh, preventing harassment, et cetera. The best thing you can do for this is have a code of conduct. I'll talk a little bit more about what that actually means on the next slide. Actually, Allison, can you? <laughs> um, one of the things that code of conduct does is tells everybody what your space looks like, what you want it to be like, how you want it to flow. Um, and this is important. You're not just having a community, an atheist community, because you're tired of having evenings free and want to have more board meetings. You actually have goals for your community. Um, and certain things have to happen for you to meet those goals. And you want to do this proactively. Um, we are way, way past the point where people first raised the issue that there is sexism in secular groups, it's not new. Don't wait for somebody new to tell you, just you're, do something about it now while you have a chance. Okay, now the next slide. Thank you. Um, okay, practical steps on this. Uh, supporting women in leadership roles. And this is a little different than Sam's um, developing uh, leaders and as secular women, by the way, and because of the way that this um, survey was structured, we're doing a lot about talking about women. Other marginalized genders, this applies to these things as well. Support gender queer people. Um, support people who are not necessarily gender conforming and run into issues because of that. So. Um, but supporting women in leadership roles means not just putting them there, but actually giving women the power to make decisions and to take steps and to not be constantly second guessed. And did he really need to, to did you have to be so harsh with him? Um, that kind of thing. you got your leaders in there for a reason. They have a pretty good idea what they're doing. There's a lot of stuff you can just let them handle. That's why, that's why you brought them in. Um, discussion moderators. 
information. Not only should you have it, but you need to recognize that this is a skill. Um, it's, so they say multitasking doesn't exist, or at least there have been studies suggesting that, that happens. Nonetheless, discussion moderation is a very strange form of multitasking. You have to be able to follow the topic that people are talking about, and at the same time, keep track of who's spoken, who hasn't spoken, who put their hand up a little bit and then maybe put it down, who's interrupting and needs to stop. Uh, just a thousand and one little social things that are happening at the same time that you're having this discussion. So if you have somebody who's actually good at moderating discussion and making sure everybody gets to speak and be heard and stopping people when they interrupt, that person is precious. <laughs> and that's true if they're a guy too. Um, so I mentioned describing the community you want to be. I, it is remarkable really when you put something together that says we welcome all of these people we want to make a safe place for people to discuss difficult topics like religious trauma. And we want you all to be aware that these are difficult discussions and to take care of each other. Um, we want you to encourage women to speak up. You know, if they're saying something to you, maybe suggest that they say it to the crowd. Um, so, Figure out what you want to be. A, a code of conduct is not just you can't do these three things and anybody who does is gone. That's that's not what they look like. They're aspirational documents. Um, that said, even once you make that that perfectly clear, things are going to happen. Make it easy for people to tell you. Give them multiple options to report. Give them multiple places to report. Um, if people are reporting to you in person or even online, make it as comfortable as possible. They are coming to you, they're telling you about a problem. Um, that's really valuable information. So make it as easy for them as possible. And that includes making it possible to complain about leaders. We have had leaders in this movement who are not great people. Um, it's, I, it's a problem with leadership. <laughs> um, the people who are, are called to high profile jobs like leadership are not always the best people. Um, when you're enforcing these, when you're enforcing your codes of conduct, be ready, but not eager to lose people. Um, in general, the way you want to take care of a problem is to say, these are our rules. You know, these are our rules. We need to know you're going to follow them. And there are going to be people who you can't tell me what to do. And I will escalate this until you absolutely have to kick me out. And then I will complain on the internet for the next decade that somebody is, is persecuting me. And, but most people won't behave like that. Most of these things are people said something without thinking about it, out of habit, um, or just because they're used to getting away with it and making it clear that they can't. It takes care of a lot. Also in this, never have a zero tolerance policy. Um, these are one of those things that a zero tolerance policy is basically you harass somebody you're gone. You never, no chance to get back in the group, anything like that. Um, they sound really great when you're trying to convince people that you're taking something seriously, but what they really do is leave it up to the person who had some trouble to decide whether they're going to get somebody kicked out. If they tell you about it, that person gets kicked out. So they know it's their responsibility and based on whether or not they speak up. Making that decision is your job, not theirs. All right. And yes, I will be talking, um, I'll be doing a workshop 
at AACON um, on more practical things, um, because this is one of those areas where everybody has a question. How should this particular thing have been handled in my group? Um, and so if you have one of those questions, um, feel free to ask it in the Q&A or um, come to the workshop. Uh, the other thing recommendation for community building is, um, and again, Sam touched on this a bit already, understand that this is really an important issue, that this is an issue that your organization should embrace, um, particularly right now. It's been several decades since we have been this close to losing legal abortion and contraception. And even if you're in a state where it's safe, you know somebody in a state where it's not. And we'll talk a little bit more about practical stuff on the next slide. Um, first of all, stop worrying that you might be spreading yourself too thin as an organization by taking on new things. Uh, this has historically in the annals of secular internet been called mission drift. It doesn't work that way. Uh, it's one of those weird things where if you touch on and work on the, um, the issues and the, the advocacy positions, all of that stuff that other people are interested in, you are more likely to grow your group rather than have the same group of people that you've always had just doing one more thing. That's not how this works. In fact, you probably have members who are already involved in um, particularly abortion activism. I know at Minnesota Atheists, we have had several members who have been clinic escorts. It's not a formal thing that Minnesota Atheists was doing, um, but there were a good handful of us on Saturday mornings at the local clinic. Um, which was always interesting when the young folks from the religious schools showed up to, to do the same thing. Go, oh, you're, you're atheists, okay. Um, so, you know, if you have people who are already involved in this work, bring them in to talk about it. It's, you know, ask them if they're willing to do the work under your name if you want to recruit people from your organization to work with them. Um, the, the tools are already there. But don't expect to suddenly be hailed as a hero or to be thought of as having all of the right answers. Um, again, this is a 50 year old issue just since legalization. There are organizations out there that are already working very hard on reproductive rights and reproductive justice, and they know what they're doing. Um, the reason that maybe they haven't gotten ahead as much as you would like is not that they're incompetent, it's just there is very, very organized opposition to abortion and legal contraception in the US. Um, so if you don't have people already doing that work, reach out to a local reproductive rights or reproductive justice organization and ask what you can do. Is there a protest you can send some folks to? Are there um, clinic escorting opportunities that you can make people aware of, all that kind of stuff. The other thing to know about this, and one of the big problems that uh, secular organizations get into is that because they're brand new to this issue, they don't understand the variety of activism in here. Um, you'd be amazed how many organizations, secular organizations make the news by deciding that what they really ought to do is show up and counter protest protesters outside of an abortion clinic, when all of that does is make things far worse for the patients. Um, so some of the things that you can work on, you can raise money for abortion funds. These are 
uh, generally funds that are paying for travel and they're going to get a whole lot uh, more necessary if a good what, two thirds of our states stop even offering abortion and several of the largest ones. Um, so people will need to travel, they'll need to be able to set up in a hotel for a couple of nights because this often takes two appointments. Um, there's a lot of use for money there. And, you know, a bake sale for an abortion fund is not a bad way to go. Um, clinic escorting. You may have already gotten the sense from what I've said about protesters that this is a very specialized job. Um, it is, in fact, something that a lot of atheist activists I know say they can't hack because it is really, really non-confrontational. And it doesn't seem like it, but it is. So if you're going to get people involved in that, you should understand that. Um, but there are opportunities for protests. Most of the protests that happen are at legislatures. Um, and there's lobbying work to be done. Um, here in Minnesota, we have a local group called Unrestrict Minnesota, which is trying to get rid of our remaining abortion restrictions. Uh, that are not medically indicated. So that there is, you know, there are things to do. Protesting uh, what they call um, crisis pregnancy centers, which are basically fake abortion clinics. You advertise this place, come here if you're pregnant and in trouble. And um, there often aren't even medical staff. Yeah. Um, and it's just a few people handing out a bunch of information about religion. They're not pleasant places, and we don't really do enough to highlight that problem. Um, there are also opportunities for even more radical work. If you're a, a group in that kind of um, position, you notice maybe that I talked about reproductive rights and reproductive justice. Those are different things, reproductive rights are the kinds of things that we um, generally talk about in mainstream um, abortion rights and contraception rights and that kind of thing. Reproductive justice gets a whole lot deeper. Um, you'd be talking about race and class and medical technology and all uh, the kinds of things that we make available to parents as resources. Um, so there are opportunities to get really, really deep into this if that's something your organization wants to do. But as you can see, there are lots of options. Um, and you know, if you need a pointer someplace to start, let me know. Let, let Sam know. Um, you know. Lots of us have done abortion and contraception work in this movement. And I think that is it for that uh, recommendation. Terrific. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you, Sam. Um, on there, Sam, Sam McGuire, uh, what sort of questions do we have? It's going to be Sam and other Sam tonight. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> So the slide up here has some information, but then I'm going to um, ask you, Allison, to go ahead and stop sharing. I will make sure everybody gets contact information afterwards. Uh, that way I can go ahead and spotlight our speakers and then do Q&A. So you're not trying to figure out all of us at once. We had a bunch of really good questions go in. I want to go back and touch on one um, just to sort of go back and define something. This one is for Sam, and it was, can you explain what shielding is going back to your slide um, to sort of flesh out a little bit what that means? Sure. Um, shielding is when, uh, you know, it's a counterpart or not counterpart it's a uh, advanced tokenizing essentially uh not only are you holding up someone as an example of uh you know diversity in your organization you're also using them as a way to uh deflect criticism 
um, you know, there's the whole, especially nowadays, um, because in like, you know, post, uh, you know, George Floyd protests uh, and, and other racial reckonings, um, you know, what groups uh, want to do is where, you know, they realize, oh, my group is super white, so we better have uh, super white and super male, so we better have a woman in here, we better have a person of color in here. Um, and tokenizing is really just when their objective is to check off the box. Um, and shielding is when, you know, you're, they're actually using the person in ways that are, you know, not respectful of their humanity. <laughs> um, it, and really just uh, a way to try, like a, a way to claim that you don't need to change anything. Uh, this person, uh, thinks that how we're running things is fine and they're of this community. So, you know, you have no grounds to criticize. Um, it's really just throwing that person under the bus. And this is actually how so many marginalized people get burned in the community also. Um, if, you know, if marginalized people, uh, you know, women, people of color, uh, trans people, uh, are able to like, actually find this community in the first place, uh, frequently they don't last very long. And it's in large part because of things like this. And then along the same lines, um, we'll have to have you do a whole workshop talking about some of your terms. In one of your slides, you use the phrase men and non-men and somebody was questioning what that meant. What are non-men hoping that you weren't referring to trans females? So I wanted to make sure that we address that one. Yeah, uh, men and non-men includes, you know, or wait, it would have been women and non-men. Uh, women includes trans and cis women, uh, and non-men includes, uh, you know, generally non-binary people, uh, people who do not find that there are, they are in either the category of women or men, but are nevertheless, uh, marked in very gendered ways um, uh, that, you know, marginalize them. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna ask a question of Allison about the, the, um, the research, but we also had a question that people were asking, if it's possible, go down to the bottom of your reactions and there's like a little raise your hand icon and somebody was wondering if we could ask all the attendees here for if you are part of a local organization or a national organization, if there's over representation of men in the executive positions in your secular organization. So I didn't set up a full poll for that, but it'd be interesting for people to raise your hand while we go to the next question. Um, so a question about the actual survey data, Allison was, is this the first survey of its kind that has been done? And I would say that's both the special report, but also the US Secular Survey. Um, and I know you touched on that a little bit, but sure. talk about what other things have been coming out of this space. Well, I think Stephanie was actually part of this or aware of it, that there was a US Secular uh, Census or something, the Secular Census was several years ago, and that was uh, sort of like a massive report. It was a different type of format and connected in a very different way, but that was also a large report of, I mean, that was a large gathering information about non-religious people. Uh, I think this report is, is pretty different and a, a different take on it, and that it was done you know, in like a, a small window period and then subject to, you know, scientific, uh, we have a research team that was able to take the data and analyze it and apply various statistical method methodologies that I cannot really tell you about because they're researchers and I'm a lawyer, but still uh, they were able to produce very terrific data um, and, and really uh, useful for a lot of purposes. Uh, so I think it's different in some pretty uh, marked ways. Um, but this is, I know, the largest type of survey that's been um, conducted in this way. And it's also different from a lot of other surveys in that it's not a membership survey. Like I know some orgs do surveys of their membership, right? That's not what we're talking about here. Um, we actually worked with like a ton of other, uh, both local and national, you know, non-religious organizations to get the data out there, to get the survey out there and get people to respond. And we looked at the numbers, who belongs to what organizations 
only about 10% were actually members of American Atheists. Um, the largest group that people were members of was actually FFRF, which was something like 14%, if I recall correctly. So um, it was very, very, and a lot of people were members of any national or local organization. So it was, uh, now I can't say, it's because that's true, I can't say it's representative of all non-religious non people in the country, because we just can't say that, but it is a very good, mixed, diverse group, which is helpful in a lot of ways. Did that answer your question? Was there another part there that I missed? No, I think it did. Stephanie, do you want to add anything to that? Since uh, I just would mention that the uh, older survey that Allison mentioned was run by Mary Ellen Sykes, who was one of the founders of Secular Movement. So this one's interesting too. Um, this person, it's part comment, part question. It's kind of a two-part question too, so we might wanna pass this one around a bit. Um, I thought it was very telling that the researchers said that the dynamic in the focus groups was different in mixed gender groups versus all one gender groups. Yeah. If you haven't read the report, um, we can talk about what exactly was said in there and the sort of unusual circumstances of that. Um, so any thoughts on, on that and why it would be, and then related it, be, to Stephanie's uh, points is, are there any good resources for learning how to moderate these discussions? So it's kind of a two-parter. Why don't I take the first part and then I'll pass it uh, over to, um, to you, uh, Sam and Stephanie. To, to, great. So we actually, in preparation for doing the survey, we actually did at American Atheists, I guess it's the last time we actually had a conference in person back in 2019, uh, back in Cincinnati, right? We had focus groups, um, quite a number of them, uh, over, over a dozen, maybe something like 15 different focus groups where we tried to gather information about what people's experiences are, what challenges they face as non-religious people. We did for try different types of focus groups, like focus groups of, of women, for example, focus groups of um, people of color, um, different types of different, um, I think some of were like younger people, just to give you an idea, because that's, in order to put together a massive survey like this, we needed to understand what people's experiences were uh, and what sorts of things they were concerned about so we know what types of questions to ask. And as part of that, you know, I was having, uh, we were talking, I was talking with the researchers afterwards and independently, all the researchers noticed this dynamic in like the, the focus groups that were just women versus mix is that the women were much more often talked over, that they did not, um, you know, feel comfortable sharing, that they often relented and that other people speak. Uh, and that was just a recurring pattern. And it, it happened um, e in mixed settings, even if there were, for example, more women than men. So anyway, I'll stop talking there. Uh, and I, I, brought, I brought it up here, I brought it in this, we, we, we didn't pull most of the data from the focus groups into the survey itself, but we pulled that specifically because it seemed very relevant to what we were discussing in this, in this report. Um, as for resources on moderation, I know I have pulled those together. I believe they are on the Secular Woman site, but it's been a number of years. Strangely enough, a lot of those come out of um, geek conferences where we have panel discussions of uh, um, people who definitely do not all have the same expectations for how social interaction should work. Um, but if they are not up there, I will make sure they get up there in the next day or two. And we'll make sure we email you any links <laughs> that we have in the follow-up email that I go out tomorrow. Sam, did you want to add anything to that? Um, just, I guess, a perspective. Um, I think uh, as a society, as a community, uh, and even as individuals, uh, a lot of us heavily underestimate the degree to which many, if not all women live under the fear of being declared constitutionally and uh, aggressive harpy, essentially. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that alone could be enough to account for the disparity um, in you know, women speaking out in mixed groups versus uh, groups with just other women. Um, even if you know the mixed group is more women than men, um, because in you know it's not 
when you get in an argument with a man, it's not necessarily always just, oh, I got in an argument with a woman. It's, oh, that woman is dispositionally unpleasant. That, <laughs> uh, that woman is dispositionally a bad person slash woman, uh, immoral, whatever. Uh, every kind of negative judgment becomes not just like that instance or, you know, no one thinks you're having a bad day. And there's so many ways as a woman to have a bad day. Um, you know, they think, oh, it's her period. This is how she is in her heart of hearts. <laughs> um, and, you know, women are also not forgiven as easily. Um, so I think everyone's just kind of aware of the tightrope that women are walking uh, at all times. And you know, also people of other genders for sure. Um, just to not have everything they say now and in the future be disregarded entirely. So the last thing I wanna share is actually more of a comment than a question, but I thought it would be a good one for some sort of closing thoughts of where do we go from here? Um, which also, as Stephanie mes met, mentioned, we're having a convention next month in Atlanta, Georgia. And we're gonna be talking about a lot of these issues in community organizing and how to have set up your space in your community the way you want, and then be able to enforce some of those boundaries. So I will drop that link in the chat in just a minute. But this, this comment kind of spoke to me and I know it will probably speak to most of us. So I thought it'd be a good thing to close on with commenting. Um, she said, in my secular groups, the women could plan the party, but the men did the public speaking, made all the decisions and conducted all of the civil and legislative work without apology, so I left. And so I sort of was hoping we could talk about um, how that is changing and how we can change it as sort of a closing. I always like to finish with a, where do we go from here sort of question, so. I think one of the things that we're doing really well um, as a movement is um, we're ganging up on them. Um, <laughs> we are <laughs> women and um, other minoritized genders are are increasingly talking to each other when we take um, when we take leadership positions when we're doing work um, and it gets a whole lot harder to think oh this is just me I'm, I'm doing something wrong that I'm not getting recognition for this when you discover it's happening to everybody else and it is also a whole lot easier to go to people within your organization and say you know I don't have to do this when you know that you haven't been doing anything wrong. And uh, one of my favorite short stories is uh, by Ellen Montgomery who wrote Anne of Green Gables. It's actually a story about a church group. Um, it's called The Strike at Putney. It's lovely. You can probably find it uh, online very easy to read, but the women striking because they're not allowed to speak from the pulpit is, uh, it's just a beautiful moment. If religion has given me nothing else, it's given me that. Well, I will say we do have a whole lot more women in leadership, um, particularly at the national level. Um, I haven't traveled in a couple of years, so Sam, you probably have a better sense of local groups than I do. I haven't traveled much either, but I know, <laughs> I, but you've talked about it. It's certainly changing, right? I, I would say that, you know, even in the last decade, it has changed a lot. Um, there's there's a lot more women. There's a lot, there's also a lot more intentionality about it in the last decade, I think, where when you're choosing boards, when you're choosing organizers, when you're choosing folks who should be in leadership looking around and trying to get a diverse set of voices, I think has become um, much more valued by organizations, even if they're just a small meetup group, right? So they can be anywhere from a big nonprofit like WASH or Minnesota Atheist to just a meetup group. And I think people are more aware of if we, if we have different types of leadership, then as you were saying, that leadership will offer different kinds of event 
And those events will bring different people into our spaces. And I know as organizers, we hear it all the time. How do we get more women? How do we get more people of color? How do we get more young people? Well, you offer things that they're interested in doing and then they'll show up. Sam? Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, I think another thing that also kind of just goes, uh, I guess, un unacknowledged, um, something I learned from when I first began organizing, um, you know, when we restructured the student group, um, suddenly there were just all these women coming out of the woodwork, all of these ex-Muslims coming out of the woodwork. Uh, and this was before anything specific had even been done to do that. Um, and I think a lot of it was largely because, you know, there was someone visibly in meetings countering all the white male bullshit. <laughs> um, you know, if, not everyone wants, if someone's looking for community, they don't want to go in and immediately feel like they have to fight everyone there, you know? Um, so to know that like there is someone who has your back already in the group, um, who you may not even have to say anything about, you know, uh, something because there's always one person, someone or another who is willing to take up, take that up for you. It's not always going to have to be you, I think is really, um, it's really, important and underrated as uh, a way to get to where uh, we want to be. Thank you for that. And the last comment of the night, I think is a good one. It says, we need more of you. We can grow stronger. Now I don't feel so alone. So that's exactly why we're here and exactly what the report says. So, um, and definitely, I mean, again, in that email, we'll, we'll list out some resources for finding local groups, for finding community, and um, being able to connect with folks. And so you don't feel alone out there in the world. Allison, any closing thoughts? No, thank you so much. And thank you, Stephanie and Sam, and for Sam for arranging all this. Um, uh, this report, I'm, I was really excited to release it, and Secular Women has been fantastic in helping us promote it, and they have really great resources, and so does American Atheist to highlight to help groups sort of uh, adapt some of these recommendations. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, again, for joining us that's in the audience. Uh, we really appreciate you being here to learn with us and discuss with us all of our um, work in the survey and and all of the things that we have going on here at American Atheist. And hopefully you can join us in Atlanta. It's uh, April 14th to the 17th in Atlanta next month. I dropped the link in the chat, but I'll make sure I put it in the follow-up email as well. Thank you everybody and have a great night.